We have a lot to cover off in today's video. I want to start with the unemployment numbers, both here in Canada and in the U.S. And in both cases, the numbers are up. And of course, they're both super uh, important to how the economy is expected to perform. Um, I'm also going to look at the most recent U.S. inflation numbers. Bitcoin and gold have both been on a tear. Should you own them in your portfolio? The Bank of Canada is juggling interest rates and trying to reduce inflation, but without adding too much fuel to an already solid housing market. And I have two retail stories, both pointing to troubles with the U.S. consumer. Today is Friday, March 15th, 2024. If you're new to the channel, it'd be very nice if you would go ahead and subscribe. Now, let's get started with today's top news stories. I wanna to start today with some new job numbers, both here in Canada and in the U.S. In February, Canada's economy saw the addition of about 41,000 new jobs. And this truly is a sign of the strength that's driven by the country's continued strong population growth, which is still outpacing uh, gains in employment. Despite the job growth, though, the unemployment rate saw an increase to 5.8%, and that's a reversal from the decline that we saw back in January. Uh, growth in jobs was predominantly seen in the services sector, significant boosts in both accommodation and food services. So this strong, robust population growth seems to be really heavily influencing the job numbers. And Doug Porter, he's an economist at BMO, and he points out that while the headline numbers are encouraging, they're notably supported by this strong population growth and so that it might indicate a cooling labor market beneath the surface. A couple of other things that came out of this most recent report. Um, women's participation in the workforce stood at 47.3% in February. There is a notable wage gap that persists. Women currently are earning 87 cents for every dollar earned by men um, in that core working age group. The unemployed population grew by 35,800 from the previous month. So now that is 1.26 million. That increase is mostly noted for core aged men and young men. Now to keep everything in perspective, despite the, uh, the growth in job gains, the unemployment rate, which of course it measures the proportion of the working age population that is employed, declined now for the fifth consecutive month. And that is the longest streak of declines we've seen now since 2019. So this suggests that while jobs are being added, the rate at which they're filling doesn't keep up with the population growth. Now, if I shift to the U.S., the unemployment rate in February rose by 0.2%. That is now 3.9%. That is now at the highest level since January 2022. And it came in above expectations of only 3.7%. The number of unemployed people increased by 334,000. That now sits at 6.5 million. Um, as for the latest U.S. inflation report, the annual inflation rate in the U.S. unexpectedly went up to 3.2% in February. That is up uh, compared with 3.1% in January. And most importantly, probably it comes in above the forecast, which were 3.1%. Uh, drilling down a bit, energy costs dropped less than expected. They were down 1.9% versus 4.6% decline in January. Gasoline declined 3.9% versus 6.4% month over month. Utility gas service fell 8.8% versus the 17.8%. And fuel was down 5.4% versus a decline of 14.2%. When we look at the annual core consumer price inflation, which strips out volatile sectors such as food, energy, and again, I'm speaking here in the U.S., um, it eased to a near three-year low of 3.8% in February. That's down slightly from the 3.9% that we saw in January. It also uh, exceeded the expectations and the forecast, which were only 3.7%. The shelter index that accounts for roughly two thirds of the 12 month increase, it increased by 5.7% in February. That slowed a little bit from the 6% that we saw the prior month. On a monthly basis, core consumer prices rose by 0.4% in February. That's the same as they uh, were the month before, but they again came in above market expectations, which were 0.3%. Bitcoin and gold, which are obviously are two of the most prominent alternative assets, they've been making headlines recently as they both have recently hit a record highs. Starting with Bitcoin, their rise to new heights, of course, um, has sparked discussions with investors about whether it's maybe time to reconsider having cryptocurrency in your portfolios. Gold, on the other hand, it's raised questions about the disconnect between the, the increasingly uh, soaring price of the gold itself uh, and the struggling prices of the share prices 
of many of the gold producers. Now, as has been the case historically, uh, Bitcoin's journey uh, to this new height has been characterized by volatility. Its price recently hit a high, an all-time high of over $73,000. That's retreated a little bit down to $68,340 um, as of today. And this has probably uh, been fueled quite a bit by the regulatory approvals for these Bitcoin exchange traded ETFs that we've seen authorized recently uh, in the United States. These trading vehicles, these ETFs have seen it, uh, made it easier for investors to gain exposure to Bitcoin. And this, of course, has led to an increased demand and, of course, trading volumes. Um, also, anticipation of the upcoming halving event, which comes up next month now, this is, has historically led to price increases as well and contributed to the, the bullish sentiment. As far as gold is concerned, it has rallied to fresh uh, record highs, almost hitting $2,200 an ounce. It's hovering today uh, slightly below that at $2,160. This upward momentum has been driven in large part by geopolitical tensions that we've seen around the world. Uncertainty, of course, surrounding the US presidential election and also cited was concerns of China's economy. Despite gold's rally, um, as I mentioned, the share prices of a lot of gold producers haven't reflected this success. They attribute things like rising production costs, supply chain disruptions are still being uh, noted, and challenges in increasing output, which have hindered the performance of the gold stocks, despite you know the, the, uh, the commodity itself reaching these new record um, highs. So now investors are basically faced with the question of, do you invest in Bitcoin? Do you invest in gold? Or in some cases, do you invest in both? Uh, I think that Bitcoin does offer, obviously, potential for significant returns, but it does remain a very volatile asset. So there's a, a very strong risk reward trade-off with Bitcoin. Gold, on the other hand, it's viewed more as a safe haven during times of economic uncertainty, but obviously it has its own set of challenges. And particularly, as I alluded to, going back to the actual, if, if you're investing in the gold producers themselves, um, ultimately, uh, my opinion here, both Bitcoin and gold represent opportunities with the commensurate risks for investors. So while the, the prices have surged and certainly has caught the attention of a lot of people, I always think you default back to being prudent and these investment decisions should factor in other things like diversification, your risk tolerance, the long-term outlook for these alternative assets in a dynamic and ever-changing landscape. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Harvest ETFs, which recently passed over the $4 billion level in AUM, where they believe in building and preserving wealth through the long-term ownership of high-quality businesses. So whether you are in the market for equities or fixed income, they've got the right blend of products to help you reach your financial goals. Now, at Harvest ETFs, their core offerings revolve around covered call strategies and helping generate income for their unit holders. To highlight ticker HHL, the Harvest Healthcare Leaders Income ETF has over $1.4 billion in AUM, provides investors with an 8% plus yield and exposure to 20 large capitalization global healthcare stocks. This one is a favorite amongst Canadian investors. And this of course is just one of their many offerings if you are more into fixed income. Their ETF HPYT, it focuses on US Treasury ETFs with a covered call option strategy. They have all-in-one solutions like HDIF, the Harvest Diversified Monthly Income Funds. They make portfolio allocation a breeze, and the list goes on and on. But regardless of the fund, the goal with Harvest is to ultimately deliver reliable, high monthly distributions to their investors. Harvest ETFs is a game changer for income investors and their consistent returns, their strategic approach may align perfectly with your financial goals. Visit harvestetfs.com or click on the link in the description of this video to learn more about Harvest ETFs. At its last meeting, the Bank of Canada kept interest rates at 5% and an area that Bank Governor Tiff Macklin brought up are concerns that a rate cut might overheat the spring housing market and reverse any progress that has been made in controlling inflation. Since July, um, interest rates have remained unchanged. And this is that effort to balance the need for that restrictive monetary policy against the risks of undoing uh, two years worth of efforts now to bring down inflation. The decision, uh, with the most recent decision, it comes with the housing market now showing signs of recovery with a potential rebound that could again fuel inflation, especially um, during what's coming up the traditional active spring season. To my eye, the bank's cautious stance here is reflecting the fears that lowering interest rates could just exacerbate the housing market's activity, making homes even less affordable. 
Also, um, housing costs make a huge contribution to inflation, right? Through rising uh, mortgage interests, through rent prices. So the dilemma is to whether to cut rates and alleviate the household financial pressure or to maintain them to prevent the inflation from spiraling. If I look forward, the Bank of Canada's next move is in April. That's going to hinge on any new economic data, obviously, that comes out between now and then. They'll be focused on inflation rates and housing market activity. And the bank uh, really does face a tight uh, balancing act here. They're aiming to provide that long-term stability while navigating the immediate economic challenges. Despite the desire for the lower inflation, the interest rates, the bank's priority has to be on preventing premature actions that would allow inflation to make a comeback and uh, to jeopardize any economic progress. McDonald's says that they've noticed a shift in consumer behavior with lower income Americans opting more and more now to eat at home rather than dining out due to the increasing uh, prices at restaurants. Ian Borden, he's McDonald's chief financial officer, he highlighted at an investor conference recently that the company is navigating through a tough uh, consumer environment, which has made it worse by inflation, uh, higher interest rates, of course, and shrinking savings. Um, even at fast food chains, it seems now, the combination of factors that we just talked about um, has made dining out feel more of a luxury as recent inflation data is showing that restaurant prices have risen by 4.5% over the last year. This has made it more expensive compared with grocery shopping, which in the U.S. saw a 1% increase in prices. Now, historically, McDonald's, of course, has prided itself on offering value and affordability. But even in this current economic climate, um, the we've seen this alteration of consumer priorities. The cost of dining out is becoming less feasible for a lot of people. Uh, they're choosing to eat more at home to manage their budgets a little bit better. And this is a significant change um, even from last year where, as I said, those cost dynamics of eating out versus grocery shopping um, have, have shifted. Now, McDonald's, they are striving to attract customers as they're sort of responding to this and they're trying to provide more value for the money, particularly through special offers and bundles that are priced at $4 and lower at most of its U.S. locations. And these efforts are sort of more of a broader strategy to remain appealing to the consumers who are becoming more and more uh, budget conscious. It's clear that McDonald's is facing a pivotal moment uh, in adapting to the changing consumer habits brought on by these broader economic challenges and consumers as they continue to tighten their belts. Uh, companies like McDonald's and other fast food type investments, they continue uh, to have to find these innovative ways to offer more convenience without compromising the quality. And you can, that's obviously a subjective uh, word there, the quality. This current shift in consumer behavior is also highlighting a growing trend towards more prudent financial management amongst consumers. And this is a lesson, uh, as we're gonna see in the next story here, that extends even beyond the fast food industry. In some more consumer-related economic news, Dollar Tree has announced that it's going to be closing nearly a thousand stores in the U.S. This move is coming after a fourth quarter loss that surprised a lot of people and it marks a dramatic shift from uh, when it bought a family dollar back in 2015 for over eight billion dollars. And that acquisition was supposed to expand Dollar Tree's reach and compete more strongly in that uh, you know, discount retail market, particularly against Dollar General. But the integration of the family dollar into the Dollar Tree's operations has certainly proven to be more challenging than they expected, and it has resulted in substantial financial strain. In the first half of this year, about 600 family dollar stores are slated for closure. An additional 400, which is 370 family dollar and 30 dollar tree stores, are expected to close over the next few years. This decision follows a comprehensive review of the company's portfolio. It's aimed at identifying underperforming stores and enhancing the standards uh, and growth in the remaining ones. Now, interestingly, uh, Canadian stores, they weren't included in the review, and as of now, they're not affected by these closures. The financial difficulties stemming from the financial dollar acquisition, as I mentioned, they've been pretty significant. In its most recent filings, Dollar Tree recorded a $950 million impairment against uh, impairment charge against the family dollar trade name and a $1.07 billion goodwill charge. Those are pretty big numbers. Neil Saunders, he's the managing director for Global Data, and he described the acquisition as botched uh, right from the start. He said it's been uh, problematic for Dollar Tree ever since the deal was completed. Now for consumers, the store closures obviously might limit some shopping options, and particularly for that contingent that relies on the discount stores amidst the higher inflationary environment that we're living. On the other hand, if you try and look at it optimistically, these efforts by Dollar Tree, they could uh, refocus, they could improve its operations. That itself could potentially lead to a stronger, more resilient business in the long term. 
Before I sign off, don't forget to subscribe to our Pulse newsletter that goes out every weekend. If you haven't already done so, visit our Investing Academy website. I will put a link for both the newsletter and the Academy in today's video description. Again, thank you so much for watching. Hope to see you in the next video.